A view from space is now practically routine despite their immense complexity. Everyone now associates satellite imaging with a view of your home's roof from a few kilometers above thanks to online maps. Many people have probably recently seen satellite photographs from the invasion of Ukraine, which provide current views that cut through the fog of war. These mental pictures, however, conceal the other uses for space imaging as well as the reality that visual information only makes up a portion of the picture. Since the market for images has been opened up by advancements in microsatellites, obtaining space imagery is no longer a challenge. These generate a lot of space-based picture data that, with the right post-processing, can provide answers to queries about biodiversity. On their electrical lines, utilities are increasingly using predictive maintenance, which entails routine scanning and monitoring. Mark Spieler of NVIDIA-stated LiDAR and supercomputers might start a wave of infinitely complicated digital twins in a recent interview with Power Technology. However, Sashin Mishra, head of Europe and sustainability at AI Dash, and Abhishek Singh, CEO of the company that analyzes satellite imagery, are at odds. They stated that there is more to the sky than meets the eye and that, due to the difficulty of monitoring utilities, landscapes, or specific habitats, space may be the only place suitable for precise asset monitoring. What is seen from orbit? Different satellite providers provide imagery at various times, from various angles, and with various wavelengths. Therefore, the visible band is simply one of the accessible wavelengths, according to Singh. We also have multispectral bands which include wavelengths like radio waves, shortwave infrared, and near-infrared. These various bands each have a unique set of skills and information to offer. Visual bands cannot see through clouds, therefore, we are unable to use them to monitor flooding. Cloud-penetrating synthetic aperture radar imaging allows us to provide complete flood mapping in almost real time. Space-based monitoring can be utilized for a variety of purposes, both with a specific business and with larger environmental applications, like monitoring biodiversity, thanks to this variety of processes. I can utilize infrared images to identify whether there are pockets or portions on land which are hotter than others if I have to monitor temperatures or if there is a wildfire, says Singh. Multispectral photography with visual signatures and other bands that provide information on the health of the trees can be used to monitor forest health. It demonstrates the vegetation's aridity by displaying dead, dying, and thriving trees. The health and biodiversity of an ecosystem can then be evaluated from there. Most regions cannot be continuously, swiftly, often, or in-depthly monitored without incurring large costs. In many situations, LiDAR provides a similar service. Ground-based LiDAR imagery competes with space-based imagery for system monitoring, particularly on power lines. LiDAR builds 3D models of their surroundings at relatively close range using later emitters. Due to this, digital twins of power supply lines have grown in size, as Fugro's digital twin of Tasmania's power distribution network. Different power providers in the US utilize LiDAR to map their power lines and determine how storm-prone they are. It is futile to use LiDAR to check for biodiversity. Of course, Singh and Mishra have issues with the use of LiDAR. LiDAR data collecting is both expensive and slow, asserts Singh. It takes months to gather data since you have to fly your helicopter over the electrical wires or drive your car close to them. Once the data is gathered, it takes weeks or months to analyze it. So, by the time the analysis is completed, circumstances have changed. No utility in the world regularly employs LiDAR on its distribution lines. Monitoring transmission lines is the main application for LiDAR. It only keeps an eye on less than 10% of distribution lines in the US. LiDAR monitoring causes environmental harm, Mishra continues. A helicopter normally travels at a speed of about 200 kilometers per hour. If it covers a line in one direction, it must fly back gradually reducing its overall effective coverage. Takeoffs and landings are not included in that. 
This implies that emissions would amount to around 1 ton of carbon dioxide for a line of 150 or 200 kilometers. If we consider a satellite's whole life cycle, including its operational days and daily image collection, then keeping track of a 150-kilometer line would produce 69 grams of emissions per view. In the end, it is counterproductive in terms of sustainability. Even though satellites have an impact on the environment, image-gathering satellites are far smaller than regular satellites. These, which are as small as a clenched fist, take up otherwise empty space on other, larger satellite launches. These microsatellites presumably have low launch emissions and no operating emissions, even though their operational lifetimes are far shorter than those of bigger satellites. Biodiversity Monitoring from Space The diversity of plants and animals that exist in an ecosystem is referred to as biodiversity. Although each site has its own particular considerations, biodiversity provides a general overview of how humans have affected a region. Many industries, including construction, mining, and the majority of heavy industries have the potential to seriously harm the environment. In this situation, businesses will seek to preserve a region's biodiversity by making sure the ecosystem is unaltered when their work is finished. It is challenging to monitor the diversity of animal life using any remote method. Plants, on the other hand, are ultimately dependent on all creatures and offer a snapshot of the effects of an industrial activity on a location. In addition to utilities, Mishra notes that mining industries are showing interest as a result of biodiversity monitoring. We're talking to a customer who wants us to look at a forest in Mozambique that is subject to biodiversity restrictions. We can easily map their definition of biodiversity back into our system because they have these regulations. To be able to identify how to evaluate biodiversity, Mishra continues, you need some form of regulatory framework, and that will depend on the nation you operate in. Although not all nations have laws governing this, Europe is not the only region considering it. Every few hundred kilometers, the local vegetation and animals change. So, how do you assess whether the biodiversity you're importing is appropriate? Can you simply bring in any kind of animal or tree? The answer is no. Local varieties must be imported, and this is where the legal structure is most beneficial. Currently, there are many national definitions of biodiversity, so businesses must be careful to adhere to local laws. A standardized global definition for a region's biodiversity, according to Mishra, would really benefit the sector a lot. This would enable a global fungible biodiversity market albeit this idea is still far from being implemented. Such a market would allow for the subscription of otherwise uninterested countries, making routine biodiversity surveys a regular component of business. It is impossible to overstate how difficult it is to create a cohesive unit of biodiversity. There isn't any solid evidence that it is completely impossible though. So, who will attempt it then? Thank you so much for watching the video! Don't miss out on our latest uploads. If you wish to stay up to date with the latest space updates and discoveries, hit the subscribe button, like the video, and turn on all notifications to see more of our latest videos in the future.